Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This year, Ash Wednesday falls on Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. And the texts are what they are every year, Joel 2, 1 through 2 and 12 through 17. Psalm 51, 1 through 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 20b through 6, 10. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and then 16 through 21. Welcome to Lent, friends. Mm, yes. Not always a big preaching day, but hopefully there's some preaching going on. And these are always the texts. And there's something, I think there's a different movement in each of the four texts. Mm. Now, I know I'm kind of the guy who always says, just choose one text, but I think it's really true. You've got these four different texts that really hit on a different practice, discipline, mindset that a preacher might want to, I don't know, kind of seize on for the purposes of bringing something up, whether that's the confession, forgiveness in the psalm, whether that's the notion of a public piety and private piety and reward in Matthew 6. Uh, the notion of reconciliation and suffering in Second Corinthians. I don't know. That's just a, those are my initial thoughts. Uh, it feels like Ash Wednesday comes every three months when you do a podcast, <laughs> a weekly yeah. podcast. I, well, I was actually thinking something similar, Matt, when I was looking through these texts this time around, and it's probably because of the preacher and me too. But I found four R words that I <laughs> that I want to lift up. That that and I, you know, usually I'm pick pick a text and and focus on that text, but there was a, a connection here. I'm not sure if necessarily it's a linear flow, but an interconnection of, as you said, sort of stances or themes of Lent that one could the preacher could lift up. And so in Joel, you get this uh, you get this idea of returning to the Lord. So return. Uh, the psalm is about restoration. The Second Corinthians passage, reconciliation, and then Matthew, righteousness. So return, restoration, reconciliation, and righteousness, and how each of those four themes or four realities or ways in which we describe or think about our relationship with God and with one another, particularly on this liturgical day, might offer, I think, some homiletical inspiration if if the preacher were to choose that. Could we call them the four rectifications? Four rectifications, if you or repairs. If you'd like to. Yes, you guys are on a roll. Oh, we, are, we can market this. You're on a roll today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm going to um, uh, pick a text. Uh, so I'm usually the one that's stringing everything together. Um, I'm going to pick a text. And uh, it's a text that I've preached from uh, before. And it made re me remember, um, Matt, you began that, um, you know, there's not always a lot of preaching on Ash Wednesday. Um, I preached this because I was working at an institution that had chapel, a regular weekly chapel on Wednesday. So the Ash Wednesday was a normal preaching schedule. Um, and I, I preached the Joel text. And I basically played uh, on that that first line of blowing the trumpet, sounding the alarm, or um, uh, I think the title was uh, somebody ought to say something. And in the midst of all that has been going on around us, in um, just uh, in in these uh, as this year has come along, um, you know, over the last few years we've had. Uh, We've tried to find fun in the midst of the pandemic and the quarantine and the craziness. And there were all these memes that went up that said things, you know, like um, that were criticizing the year. 
you know, these are the things that had happened by, you know, the end of February 2020, end of February 2021, end of February 2022. Um, when 2023 came around, there was a meme that said, okay, let's, let's no one claim 2023, let's cautiously go in. And yet, the reality is, is 2023 has been uh, as tumultuous a reality for us as any other. And maybe sounding the alarm, maybe saying something is the way to enter into this season of Lent as a community, that we are going to speak truth, even though it's a hard truth, but we're going to speak it in community and we're going to speak it for building up the body, for repairing community, to go back to the R words. I really appreciate that focus on community. That's the, the Matthew 6 text strikes me as very individual. This is what you individually should do. The, the Joel one is very much about what kind of a community you want to live in and what are you going to do together to be part of that, which is what we all say we want. But when, you know, when are those moments where somebody, like you said, somebody ought to say something or somebody blows a trumpet? How does a community come together and say, who do we want to be in the world? It doesn't necessarily mean a neighborhood or, a, or a, a, a nation, but this starts with like a congregation. It starts with a gathering. So to, I, I love the way the Joel text puts that on us. You are part of a group of a people. And that's a tremendous source of power. It also, I think, intensifies your potential culpability for all of the, of the woes and injustices. Well, and I think well, and I the... Think the reality of reality. those four, you know, those four are things that I, that I mentioned. What were they again? Uh, they are return, restoration, reconciliation, and righteousness. It would be easy to individualize those, of course. Uh, and so the reminder of community and the reality of coming together on this, on this day as a community and thinking about what does it mean to begin this season to return to the Lord, but return to the Lord together. And what does it mean to think about restoration and what needs to be restored, what relationships need to be restored, what about the community needs restoration? Where are there moments of reconciliation that that are that are moments of accountability and and response to the neighbor? And how is it that uh, how is it that all of this is for the sake of uh, righteousness or living in righteousness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness? In the case of Matthew, that has everything to do with the fact that this is a community that's embodying what God's justice looks like in the world. So uh, it's it's always an important. I think it's an important corrective. Maybe maybe that's not. That's not right, but the way in which we uh, we that we are coming together in this on this day and uh, and there's something quite mm, spiritually important about about doing all of this work in the in the midst of a community next to somebody sitting next to somebody standing next to somebody. And how is it that we help each other think about these um, these ways of relating to God, to one another, and to the world? I think those are all really important uh, themes that we would want to lift up. And staying with this idea, this is a communal text. This is the text of a people. Um, we often have begun to read the Bible on our own, but it has been shared down through generations from uh, our ancestors, if I can use that word. And um, and so as I read Joel, uh, I think of the calling of a fast from the book of Esther, uh, which was the um, importance of an individual stopping to look for saving themselves and to attending to the communal need that Mordecai said, you know, just because you're in this place doesn't mean you're eternally safe. If, if something happens to your people, it's going to come to you. So again, that call of a fast that she made for the community 
was stepping out of an individual reality. Um, the um, Matthew text, which is a, a text that if, if, even if we don't preach it, if, if in preparing our sermons, the preacher has in mind the caution of not doing this so that you can be seen, not doing this so that what I call you get a credit card to say, oh, look what we did this year, um, but are, are doing it, and I'm going to switch texts, are doing it in, in the mode of the Corinthian text to be reconciled with God. Ultimately, reconciliation with God reinforces our capacity to be reconciled with one another because it is the spirit of God that makes possible for us to be like God in having received the forgiveness and mercy that is asked for in Psalm that we would offer that uh, forgiveness and mercy. I'll have more to say about that as we get to the Matthew text in a couple of weeks. Well, and I think- well, I wanna- Go ahead. Well, I think too that I think that's an important uh, a, an important reminder. And if if we go to the Matthew text and and sit there for just a little bit, the, uh, the beware of practicing your piety before others. The, these are all these are all plural uh, verbs. <laughs> you know, it's all y'all. And uh, so that's 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 an important reminder. But also, of course, the passage that's left out in between in between the these sections is uh is Jesus teachings on prayer and so i think that reiterates what you were saying joy is that this 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 is done for the sake of reconciliation with god or that how is it that that is a motivator and not you know one's one stance or one's you know relationship or not necessarily relationship but one's uh uh, one's appearance in in front of somebody else, but it's for the sake of this reconciliation with God and and relationship with God, and what does that relationship look like? And so prayer then becomes <laughs> central as the way in which we maintain that relationship with God, and what makes it also possible to, as you said, joy to be like God. How is it that? Prayer is that support, and prayer is that uh, cry for help, and prayer is that that uh, trust in in to be in conversation with God as to what what all of what all of these things means of returning and righteousness and reconciliation and restoration. So you you suck you snuck in Carolina a supplementary R when you started talking about relationship. Ah yes. Yeah. As this, I'm going to sneak in another okay. one, or may, I don't know, maybe this will even replace righteousness around Matthew 6. And it's something we don't often talk about with this text because it always falls on Ash Wednesday. And that's reward mm -hmm. because there's this, this repetition of almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, keep doing these things. These are all good things. But also for each one says that your heavenly father, that God who, uh, who sees in secret will reward you. And reward isn't usually an Ash Wednesday theme. We tend to talk more about kind of stripping everything down and talking about mm. austerity in certain ways. And there's a place for that. But this is one of the motivations Jesus puts before people here is that piety or righteousness does indeed have a reward, mm. which might get my 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 Protestant card taken away from me um, by some theologians, but just to spend a little bit of time with that, that that's part of the general biblical thinking around almsgiving, for example. Yes, it's done out of the goodness of one's heart. No, you should not expect recognition or praise here, but it builds up, again, to use Jesus's language, treasure in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's worth thinking about too. Is that only relate? I don't think it's monetary, but is it only relational? Is it only that? Or is there something more being promised here? Do we carry that into well-being? I mean, what are the rewards of righteousness would be an interesting mm -hmm. sermon, uh, be an interesting book that I would want to think about a little bit more. But but I don't want to pass too quickly over the fact that he does say there's something in this for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and maybe that has to do with uh, 
maybe that has to do with the fact of the of the promise of the kingdom that's present and and so the reward you know the kingdom of uh, heaven has come near 417 and so maybe part of that is the reward of being able to recognize that or even participate in that or recognition recognition yay <laughs> another r but to yeah to be able to recognize it i mean that's that's at the heart of repentance too of that perspective that allows one another r oh my gosh this is amazing amaze balls and uh so that we that we uh that part of that capacity to, or what that reward looks like maybe, is uh, is a greater capacity to have that perspective, to see the way in which the kingdom of heaven is present, or to recognize the way in which we are uh, invaluable in that, really, uh, in, in making God's justice and God's righteousness present for all people so that i think that the way in which you're suggesting matt of what does reward mean i think that could also be a really helpful homiletical direction particularly to counteract some of that reward of only being delayed or some sort of you know extra jewels in your crown <laughs> extra mansions in your Extra, well, just extra mansions, extra rooms in your mansions or whatever that you, but. but <laughs> Someone's <laughs> going to have to clean those. I'm not sure I want that, but yeah, keep going. No, uh -uh. But, but yeah, you, you get what I'm saying is that, that yeah. how do we tie reward? How, how do we tie that into deeply Mathean themes that, uh, that give reward, that idea of reward, that kind of specificity, that uh, that I think is happening here. Yeah. So so Matthew will constantly or Jesus in Matthew will constantly say the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven. And and ultimately that eschatological reality is the reward. That's that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use another R word. It's about recapturing <laughs> Um, God's original intent for creation, which is good. In the beginning, God intended this good, and God has been rewriting the narrative so that we are edited back into the path that will take us to the original design. We keep deviating or detouring, and God keeps re restoring or, or, or sustaining us so that we can return to what God's intention was. That's the reward. And so righteousness, uh, the end of oppression, the end of, of uh, injustice, uh, the um, end of poverty, the end of uh, thirst, the end of hunger, the end of disease. The, I need to stop because I'm about to start preaching in a minute. But the end of all that is upside down is the right side up righteousness of God. That is the reward that this is uh, taking us to. It might be more too. I don't want to hold on to the fact there's something more to yeah. this, but. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, the uh, should we talk about the Psalm? Cause I'm sure there's a congregation out there who, who's, who's preacher <laughs> thinks it's time for some confession. Um, another really important Lenten theme. This is restore. Uh, no, this is, let me just check my notes here. Yes, restoration, Repair. restoration. Restoration, yeah. got it. Yep, yep, yep. Restore, verse 12. Here, I mean, here's obviously a very individual psalm, I mean, at least in the voice and the setting that the that the Psalter gives it. It's, this is about an individual standing before God. One of the things, I mentioned this in years past, it frustrates me about this is there's no recognition of the harm David has done to others, but I think that's a different story, maybe a different prayer, but this is that experience of an individual standing before God and telling the truth about who they are uh, and, and needing God's restoration, um, which is such a powerful thing to think about and how you lead people into that way of thinking into that kind of spirituality in the midst of a congregation mm -hmm 
is interesting, right? So people can say, I feel like the preacher was speaking directly to me, those kinds of comments. Um, I don't know if a preacher can reverse engineer that experience and place it into the sermon, but I think it's one of the ways a passage like this can speak, uh, can, can have, can do its thing or God can do its thing through the passage is when people hear it touching down in their own experience. That's knowing your congregation in the way that Nathan knew David. That's preparing, well yeah. that's preparing in the spirit. Um, uh, one of the sermons that, um, that was most transformative for a community. And when I say that, I mean what happened in an individual's life changed the congregation. And because of the congregation's placement in the city, it literally changed the community. But it, it would not have happened if that one individual had not recognized themselves in the story as David was uh, called out to recognize himself in Nathan's story. And the response was not to say, oh, that was different, or not to say, that's bad that you're talking about, Nathan, but you know me, I, I would never cross that line. And so in this particular, in this particular uh, place, I think the individual response is critical because it's, it's, it's sometimes comfortable for us to lob the, the guilt at a group that we don't identify with or we say we're the exception. And the only way that things are going to change is if we individually stand before God and say, this is me and I need your mercy. Mm -hmm. And I'm open to you restoring my life and recognizing that that's how God's kingdom is restored. And I think too, uh, this is where I found the commentary to be very helpful that, that there's a section where Bobby Morris talks about God must bring about the new creations of a clean heart and a right spirit. The text leaves no doubt that God alone is able to accomplish these things. And so that deep trust, I mean, one of the I would I would lean more toward doing the psalm rather than talking about the psalm, but that's often what I say. <laughs> but but that the that deep trust in um, God's capacity to do that, I think, is like the homiletical stance of that of of this psalm. Um, that yeah, that God is, or or even coming before God to ask God for that, but uh, but that trust in God. So. Uh, we should go to Second Corinthians. Anything we want to say there? Well, I already mentioned uh, what I think the attitude around this should be, and that's just that this is about being reconciled to God. So your comments uh, from um, acknowledging that God uh, is the one who is doing the work, um, Caroline, uh, as we look at the psalm, seems an appropriate way to look at, at this uh, uh, Second Corinthians passage, that if God is the one who's doing the work, if God is the one who's um, making it cap possible for us to be uh, fully human, then it is God who we need to be reconciled with. And, uh, and then um, uh, I, I often will say, um, let God do what God alone can do and then see what happens when God shows up and shows out. And uh, this, this, this uh, opening for what uh, is a, a honest book, a letter, Corinthians is very honest, um, in the midst of having to endure the worst. And as we began this podcast, we've, we've come through some of the worst and it's only, you know, it's still only the second month of the year. Um, and yet in the midst of that, uh, turning to the one who is capable of restoring us, the one who has promised uh, to uh, sustain us and that we would be the ones, um, that we would be the ones who are a glimpse of God's grace. Um, it's only possible if we're reconciled first with God. Yeah. 
this is such a, a different mood than the other three passages in so many ways, this, this passage. And you're, it's good that it, that it begins with reconciliation, that they, they add that part of, of chapter 5, verse 20. And like you said, Joy, that's all, this all flows out of that. It's also a passage about, well, I'll say ruin, um, and that it talks about, there's my art, it, it talks about all of these horrible ways in which Paul and his companions have commended themselves. And this is, it's one of the passages people look to to say something was really wrong with Paul, right? He was way too into his own, his own suffering. And it's a passage that's been used in really dangerous ways when people say, how lucky you are to suffer, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, put that onto people. But the text opens up, and this is why I think it's a good text for, for Ash Wednesday in the beginning of Lent, it opens up the question of, of how can hardship actually shape us for the good? Not because it's good for us or we have to take our medicine, but I think Paul would say because of the ways in which it conforms to the example of Christ crucified and, and new life coming out of that. It's really easy for that theology to grow perverse and to get you know sick and to you know, glorify or, or valorize suffering and hardship. But people who go through hardship, people who live with chronic pain, people who live deep disappointment, the people we talked about with the Beatitudes, uh, need to know that God meets them there. Not because the suffering is some kind of magic ticket, but because that's just for the places where God likes to show up. And so, again, like you said earlier, Joy, a preacher needs to know their congregation really well. And this is a great text for at least exploring some of that hardship. Um, and by the time we record this, I'm sure the world won't have gotten any better, you know, and what's the next national or global hardship that we're going to be talking about too. But people don't have to go outside their homes to experience hardship. We all know that. And the, and the, the I think the grace here is in part, what you were intimating, Matt, is that that's that's the that's the prom, that's one of the promises of Lent or one of the realities of Lent is that God enters into all of humanity and that includes our suffering and includes our hardships and and so that there's there's nothing that God nothing we experience that God doesn't know and God God God's self doesn't experience and so I I one of the things about this passage is that it it doesn't it doesn't shy away from the the truth of what it means to be human and the human condition and the ways in which uh and we we think a lot about that during lent and our just not only not only our our surrounding realities but just our own personal challenges and and what does it mean to be human and it, it's it's this one time in the church year where we think about that for ourselves but then we also are conscious of that is the promise of that is the promise of the incarnation and crucifixion as well that we have a god who comes alongside and enters into our suffering with us <laughs> <laughs>